and let's talk about machine learning and credit underwriting together. All right, a couple of uh, technical things here. I just want to remind people that uh, no two institutions are the same. What I think is a good idea may not be a good idea for your institution, so research this uh, thoroughly. All right, who we are. Yeah, as uh, Jason mentioned, we're Coast Capital. We are um, a large credit union in Canada. We're based on the West Coast. It's a little lonely out there when it comes to uh, AI and finance. So it's nice to have been invited here. So thank you, Nicole, and all the good people at Rework for this. And I also want to acknowledge that my wife is extremely grateful to Rework because I have been forced to buy my first post-COVID suit. And um, just, like, just like maybe some of you, I don't fit in the old ones anymore. So yeah, I was due. Who cares about outlines? All right, here's my call to action. So I decided to, to focus on this talk not about algorithms and math, because you probably all have teams, consultants, or books that can help you take care of that. What I want to do with this presentation is do a bit of a call to action and basically talk about some of the things we're not talking about in AI in finance yet. E23 is changing if you're a bank or if you're an insurer, and that's your model risk management guideline. You should be, you should be thinking about what's coming down the pipe uh, for E23. C27 uh, just had its second reading in the House of Commons last week. I know that, um, I think Andre, no, Alexiev, Alexiev uh, spoke about this this morning. I'm going to go into a lot more detail. I'm not going to show you <laughs> that my solutions are awesome. I'm going to explain some of the solutions that we've explored at Coast Capital, which are some of the solutions you may also explore. But the real point of my talk is to get you thinking about what's coming down in a couple of years because it may very well change the way you do business in AI. And if you think that you don't have to worry about it if you're not a bank, think twice because C27 is for all of industry, not just banking. All right, something to keep in mind. Um, Pablo Picasso, you don't really think of Pablo Picasso as somebody who knows a lot about computers and AI, but <laughs> I really like that quote of his. Computers are useless, they only give you answers. You might think, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no. Computers are the canvas from which you paint the answer, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's true, but you know what? I really like that quote because it allows us to remind ourselves that without insight, the answers are sometimes useless. And that's an awesome thing for us practitioners in AI because that's guaranteed job security, isn't it? All right, so let's talk a little bit about the regulatory and legal landscape, the way that it's shaping up. Our government has, this, has decided to define the term artificial intelligence system. Okay, so I know there's been tons of debates over decades about what is AI and what is machine learning and what is deep learning. Well, it turns out the, the government has their own opinion about that. So they define artificial intelligence systems as something that processes data through the use of a genetic algorithm, a neural network, machine learning, or another technique in order to generate content or make decisions, recommendations, or predictions. I don't know about you, but to me, this is extremely broad. Interesting, huh? Extremely broad. So technically, a simple linear regression or logistic, reg logistic regression is AI. Now. You can disagree with it all you want, that's totally fair, but that's the opinion of government. So you can, you know, this bill is gonna go into third reading, it's gonna go to committees. You are welcome to, to lobby them to change that, that definition if you want, but that's what they're going with on second reading. And they also make one uh, term very clear. There's one term that they really care about. It's bias, biased output. They say, that decisions, recommendations, or predictions cannot adversely differentiate individuals without justification. And that's very key. I'm going to talk about that a little later in my talk. In relation to the protected categories in the Human Rights Act, race, national or ethnic religion, origin, blah, blah, blah. Okay. However, affirmative action style measures would be allowed. So I find that extremely interesting. You are not allowed to have an AI system, huh, AI, you're not allowed to have a decision system. Remember, decision system. You're not allowed to have a decision system, decision system, that biases against one of the protected categories unless you want to make your system reverse the bias 
against people in these protected categories in an affirmative action way. I find that very interesting, and I think that's unique to Canada, by the way. And as I said earlier, this will apply across all of Canadian industry, not just banking. And if you think I'm lying, if you don't believe me, that's okay. Um, I've got abundant uh, references at the bottom of my slides, and you go and go check them out. Um, yeah. All right, so if you're OSFI regulated, so if you are a federally regulated financial institution, a big five bank, a small or medium-sized bank, or an insurer, or some pension funds also, you also have to worry about E23. So like Alexia said, in May, OSFI came out with what I would call their initial draft paper on what they're gonna consider for E23. There is some really interesting stuff that we as AI financial practitioners need to start thinking about. For example, they really are going to focus on bias and explainability. So they say that explanation of model outputs enhances the ability to mitigate the risks and unintended outcomes associated with using them and supports model soundness and accountability. Um, they will tell us what the expectations on the levels of explainability required are when they, when they publish the final guideline. At this point, I'm thinking that it's probably going to be risk-based because OSFI tends to be pretty risk-based, not so prescriptive. Something tells me that you're going to have to have complete transparency for high-risk applications such as credit adjudication, which is the focus of my talk, but for maybe a recommender model, you might not have to have so much explainability. So, consultation plan for next spring, implementation targeted for a year and a half from now. So this is coming soon, friends. This is coming soon. All right, so I don't wanna talk just about regulations. This isn't the talk about regulations. I'm not even a lawyer. I'm a practitioner, I'm an AI guy like you. I'm a numbers guy. So I wanna talk about some applications of machine learning and underwriting. So many of you are already doing this at your institutions, right? So if you want to do machine learning in underwriting, anything formulaic is potentially a good application of machine learning in underwriting. So pre-qualifications uh, is very good for this. Um, part of the pre-approval process or even the entire approval process could be done algorithmically as long as it fits within your risk appetite. And what do I mean by that? If you are a credit card issuer, you might be comfortable with stated income, right? But if, you, um, if you're underwriting mortgages, you probably, I'm gonna go over here a little bit because I don't want this, this part of the audience to feel underserved. I'm all for fairness in AI, there you go. So, so if you are a mortgage underwriter, you probably also need to worry about the arm's length nature of the transaction. You probably wanna verify income. Can I, did I say B20, everybody? <laughs> Raise your hand if you know what B20 is. Okay, okay, a few people. B20 is the OSFI guideline for residential mortgage underwriting, and it's, uh, it's a big deal in the industry, in the banking industry. So, depending on your risk appetite, the entire process could be ML-driven for some applications, but for some other applications, you wouldn't be able to do that, for example, in um, residential mortgage underwriting. Some other parts might be more challenging. Um, that's it. How do you verify the income? Another one, an anecdote that I really like to talk about is that some banks actually investigated using font size and formatting in financial statements to do an AI on small business credit decisioning. I wonder how your institution would feel about doing that in terms of comfort level. Would that feel, would that fit within their risk appetite? Uh, maybe, maybe not. It's not within the risk appetite of my organization, that's for sure. Um, what else can I say? No, that's it. Okay, model explainability. So, a few of the presenters this morning have started to talk about it. And I'm going to dwell on it more from a modeling standpoint. Explainability has not been the strong suit of AI, let's face it. It's been a problem that's kind of been haunting us for 10 years, maybe 20 or 30 years actually, right? And um, that's probably gonna have to change, especially in high-risk applications like credit underwriting. So I'm gonna 
for the sake of argument, for the sake of this presentation, for the sake of keeping things simple, I'm not going to talk about the three characteristics of full explainability. I'm going to make up a very simple definition. I'm just going to say that full explainability is the ability for a human to fully understand all decisions made by a model. Okay? That's a good start for a definition, if you ask me. So at this time, full explainability is not required. But OSFI is looking at it, it's coming, and C27 is very much going to require that. So it, we cannot turn the blind eye to it. All right, so I'm not aware personally of any postdoc explanation methods for neural networks that fully meets this goal above. I'm not aware of anything like that. So Lyme and Chap, they're great, but you can fool them. So there's tons of articles about this, and you can actually go uh, grab a Python toolbox uh, on GitHub and actually demonstrate that for yourself. It can be fooled. And if you do your explanation through what I call a, uh, a proxy model or a benchmark model, what you're explaining is not your decision. What you're explaining is the decision of the proxy model. So that doesn't really help, does it? So full intrinsic explainability is best. Now you might say to me, well, okay, how do I do that? Turns out there are some solutions out there that already do that for you. So um, I am aware of Microsoft's EBM, Explainable Boosting Machine, does that. And there's a team at Wells Fargo, the model risk management team at Wells Fargo led by August Sagento, very, a very uh, smart guy who put together three distinct algorithms that are all explainable in all neural networks. At Coast Capital, we've implemented one of them, the EXNN, which is the explainable neural network. And we have seen some very good results out of it. We are going to, I am gonna show you a few of them in a few minutes. Oh yes, and there's an age old debate that if you throw too many constraints at your neural, neural bleh, if you throw too many constraints at your neural network, it will not perform as well as the so-called black box. That claim has been debunked in academic research as well, and guess what? I've got some references for that, so you're, you're, you know, you're welcome to go check it out. So by requiring your neural network to be explainable, by literally constraining the solution of your neural network to be explainable, the amount of accuracy you lose is very small. Actually, it's hardly detectable at all for most applications, and you do have complete explainability. So as far as I'm concerned, as a practitioner who was starting to dabble in AI a few years ago, this was a no-brainer to me, right? Because if you have a solution where explainability is guaranteed and you don't have a shall we say, material loss of performance from your models, why wouldn't you do that, right? So that's what we've implemented at Coast Capital. And I'm gonna give you an example of what this looks like. So this is, <laughs> I'm not gonna give you too much details about what it is, but I'll give a few details. So um, in general, it's a good idea if you're a lender, if you're doing credit underwriting, to have models for your credit decisions that are, shall we say, compatible commensurate or very look-alike to the models that you use to figure out your expected uh, credit losses, your ECL, or your capital, or for stress testing purposes, right? So what we've got here, the way we've solved that problem at Coast Capital, we simply have one model to rule them all, literally. So our education model, actually, we put a macro component into it, and that gives us the stress test model, as well as the ECL model. One of the great things about using explainable neural networks for credit underwriting, as well as your other risk purposes, like stress testing, ECL, and capital, is that you have a continuous response from all of your variables. So for example, if you use a decision tree, decision trees are awesome, they're simple, they're well understood, they're explainable, but if I'm trying to figure out what really drives the decision from my, from my decision tree, I kind of have to go through a whole bunch of if-else statements. That's not very user-friendly, is it? Plus, they're not continuous. If the risk goes up in some of the micro factors, like your credit score, your income, you might not move from one bucket to another. So the model might not see any change in risk for a small change in micro risk. Same thing for macro risks, by the way. But with an explainable neural network, one that's continuous, you can actually see the response of the model 
to any arbitrary small or large change in the risk. I actually like that a lot. So let me show you how this works. So we applied, we applied our new explainable neural network to some kind of asset lending, okay? And the answer came out at the end that there's three things that really matter to this type of asset lending. Number one, as you might imagine, credit bureau, right? That makes sense. So that first, that first rich function or that first risk function at the top, that is beacon score or FICO score, whatever you want to call it, whichever one you use. As you go from the left to the right on this plot, the value of the risk factor increases. And as you go up, the logit of default goes up. So the, you know, the logarithm kind of of your PD goes up. So here, what you see on that top plot is risk goes down linearly, or the logit of default goes down linearly with your credit bureau. That makes sense because that's how FICO, Equifax, that's how they all calibrate these things. So when I saw that straight line with an information ratio of 55%, meaning 55% of the, the decision is being made by the beacon score, I felt pretty good about this. I'm like, yeah, okay, linear and best predictor. Okay, we're, we're doing good so far. Um, I'm gonna come back to the second factor later. I'm gonna talk to the th about the third factor for now. The third factor is income at 20% of importance. So income's interesting, it's not linear. Okay, so if you use a logistic regression and you don't bin, oh, by the way, with explainable neural networks, you don't have to bin anymore, right? So that's a very, that's a very good feature of these explainable neural networks. So with income, it's very interesting. The way I read this, this plot at the bottom on the left is this. For very low income on the left, the risk is high. Okay, makes sense. As income increases at the beginning, risk decreases, but not by that much. And then when you get into very high income, the risk just drops. Does that make sense to you? That kind of makes sense to me. Okay, so again, I'm feeling pretty good about this. And you know, some people this morning asked about correlation versus causality, right? So again, we're making sure we have variables that are, uh, shall we say, economically justifiable for using these models. The second risk factor is interesting. It is non-monotonic. That can happen. Sometimes you can have low risk, the risk goes up, and then it goes down. The beauty about this formulation is that it can also handle non-monotonic and definitely non-linear risk functions. Okay, oh yes. One of the things I really like about this is that it makes acceptance of my AI models very simple with my management. All I have to say, all I have to do is literally walk them through the story I just walked you through for the last three minutes, and they're all like, yeah, that makes sense, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, and that's AI? What's, where's the big deal, right? So by fully explaining the decision of the AI, I have made my life a lot easier in terms of my conversations with my chief risk officer, my VP of risk, and uh, my regulator <laughs> makes things a lot easier. All right, model stability. Eh, I don't wanna spend too much time on this. All I wanna say here is as practitioners, it is our burden to do a good job at making sure we're not overfitting, we're not biasing, so on and so forth. You can look at the slides later. Okay, model fairness, I wanna talk about that. Model fairness is a big deal. So lack of model fairness and financial modeling has been well publicized and has prompted regulators to act. We've talked about it, C27, second reading last week, it's coming to us. Um, it's like, I personally think it's gonna pass. I think it's gonna pass because the liberal government in Ottawa, although in a minority situation, has the support of the NDP, they've got another three years in power, they're already at second reading, I think this is gonna make it to the goal line before 2025 and the next general election. So we should be paying attention to this. So Bill C-27 talks about, um, would forbid adverse differentiation of individuals without justification in relation to the protected categories in the Human Rights Act. This is very interesting because it leaves so many open questions. First of all, define fairness. Do, would you define um, adverse differentiation overall 
like in terms of all the decisions made by the model or near the decision boundary, near the threshold where you say yes versus no? That hasn't been defined and honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I don't have an answer for you on this. All I'm saying is we as a community need to start thinking about this. Also, how do you measure adverse differentiation if the data on protected categories is not available? So for example, let's say I want to figure out if my model is discriminatory with people with disabilities, with physical disabilities. How do I even find that out? I'm not going to start gathering information on the disabilities of my members and customers, am I? As a bank, can't do that. So there's a lot of questions that are left unopened. I don't have an answer for you on this one, but I'm hoping that this is going to be well defined by our dear friends in Ottawa. All right, um, let's see. No, I don't want to talk about Oh, yes, yes, I want to talk about this, yes. Something that is key to the concept of justification in uh, C27 is something that's called um, bona fide justification. This is very interesting. So bona fide justification is when you have a good reason, quote unquote, a good reason. I've got to be careful with my words. I'm going to put that in gigantic quotes, good reason. Very justifiable reasons to discriminate. And that could, happen, um, that could happen once in a while. Let me give you an example. If you're underwriting a mortgage, okay, do you believe that income is something that could justifiably deny you a mortgage? I think it should, because it's, it's clearly understood that you need to make a certain amount of income to make your payments. That's, I think that's, that's, that's self-evident, right? And although certain subgroups, certain protected categories might make less income, this could be a justification or a bona fide justification for, uh, for rejecting certain applicants on the basis of the protected categories. Of course, I'm not a lawyer. This is not a legal opinion. There is going to be a lot of clarification needed. And this concept of bona fide, by the way, I believe uh, came into being in Canada because of a case in BC, my home province, where a female firefighter was fighting against the firefighting authority because she didn't pass a physical test of endurance. The union claimed that the test was inherently biased against women because women couldn't satisfy that, uh, that, that standard of fitness that was required. And it actually went back and forth. This case is called uh, the Mayorin case, and it gave rise to what's called in legal parlance as the Mayorin test. So if you go and look at a bunch of laws, you will see the Mayorin test of justification of, of, uh, of, ju of, of denying people. All right, I only have, what, five minutes? Well, I'm going to have to rush. So here, I want to propose to you that a well-designed, continuous, and fully explainable neural network is undistinguishable from a clever use of logistic or linear regression. This is all my friends. I'm going to get away, or I'm planning to get away from trouble or stay away from trouble with my regulators, my managers, and my auditors. Here's how this works. Let's say I have some very badly behaved function like this thing here. Wow. I don't know what this is, sine of, sine of 5x times x plus whatever. I can literally use a neural network to figure out my risk functions and do my regression against the risk functions as opposed to the original variables. Sorry, I only have five minutes to explain this, but come talk to me in the break. I'll explain this into more detail. The long story short is that you can literally claim that you're using a neural network to determine the shape of your risk functions that you're only doing that, and that you can use linear logistic regression after the fact to do the actual optimization of the model. So long story short, you can, you can use neural networks to find the optimal shape of your risk functions, you give that to logistic regression, and you get the same result. And that, my friend, is how I'm gonna stay out of trouble, I think. Um, I can skip that. I don't have much time. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Glad to take your questions. <laughs>